Do you have a Twitter question? Yes, go ahead. All right, this is to Stinson and Rachel. If more kids come to Gallo, where do we put them? Small schools like us don't have much room to spare. Um, the more people that would come here, the more money we would receive from the people who are coming here. So if we had more people and more money, we could build more facilities for the people to come in here and use. In the very same way that colleges um, extend campuses when they have higher enrollment, uh, we do the same thing. In fact, that would not only be better for the kids coming here, you guys would get those opportunities that you've never had got to have here at Galvo if, if we had that increase in enrollment. So the answer is we would, we would just build on and, uh, and get more. Mr. Grant. A uh, question to Mr. Stinson and Rachel. Um, different schools would cost different money, different amounts of money under this situation of the free uh, school choice. So my question would be, how much money do you distribute to each person, or not necessarily how much, how do you decide who gets what money with the market system like that? Because different schools would cost different amounts of money, and I don't imagine that people just give the maximum, the minimum amount to get into the best school. So how would you measure uh, what families and what people would get what money? Um, actually, the schools that had better education wouldn't actually raise their prices too high because of the competition. If their price is too high and people who can't afford it, even with the vouchers, they wouldn't apply there, so they wouldn't have as many students. So people wouldn't raise their prices too high so everybody could have the chance to go to a better school. Those of you who have taken my economics class, you know that competition drives prices down. And you can think of the concern, and I think it's a great question, Richie. The concern is that how could somebody afford a great public school, or, or a great private school for that matter, if we're going to put a price tag on education? But you would be able to afford a great public school for the same reason that most of you in here can afford an iPhone, right? Well, arguably, the greatest technology that we've got. And competition has made that incredible product affordable to you because markets encourage competition and competition drives price down. This is Rick. Well, if students have freedom of choice um, and are no longer, my concern would be that could their highest performing schools be in a position where they would have to set quotas? how many students were allowed to come in because well yes you can build new buildings those things take time and you don't have guarantee of funds because students come and go in that time if they were to set quotas could that not mean then that local students may not be guaranteed an option to go to the school that is closest to them um, and if so another side to that then could schools also have an opportunity to select to admit only the best and brightest leaving struggling students. Uh, Can I touch on that? Struggling. Going, yeah. going off, Mr. Ridley is saying it's very important. My original point was I am not against choice. The question is the alternative going to benefit you. In this room, I don't know who they are. I don't want to know. We don't need to make it public, but there are students who struggle. There are students probably with learning disabilities or dysfunctions or um, weaknesses in certain areas. That's totally normal. When you look at a charter school, a good reason for the success in many of these inner cities that Mr. Stinson is referring to is they have become very crowded places. When they get overcrowded, they do not have non-discrimination laws behind them. Therefore, they can open up what's called a lottery system. In that lottery system, there's no assurance you will get in. And number two, the turnover rate in charter schools is huge. Kids moving in and out. The students that are moving out are students with learning disabilities. Where are they going back to? Public schools, who are now underfunded by the state and therefore can't support them, leading to lower test scores, proliferating the idea that we need to have alternative schools because they have set up a system of failure. Any system, a privatized system where there are non-discrimination laws, where you can weed out special education students, it's immoral. It's completely immoral to be able to say, I am not admitting you because you do not learn at the rate of this student next to you. In public schools, we don't have the choice of who we bring in here, and I'm glad we don't, because it creates a diverse environment where you experience a much broader range of people. And I truly, if you look at it, I would love to hear it from this side, which charter schools are able to get around these non-discrimination laws, all of them, because there is no oversight, because again, they were not 
set up to be a standardized school system. They're experimental zones. The problem with experimental zones is there's no oversight to make sure they're doing what they're supposed to. Kids are being left behind and they're being put back in the public schools, which is the example of why our test scores are lower. We're not getting resources, expected to make kids learn equally, not possible. Mr. North, um, this is for Mr. Norway and Curran. With Pearson releasing the park test, um, you have that on one hand, and they also have a curriculum to go with it, but colleges don't, as of right now, colleges use the ACT and the SAT, which are owned by ACT and College Board, who don't do anything in curriculum. So it's almost as though colleges use a complete third party. What are your thoughts on that? I think that most of those tests are just state issues again. Like it's not school problems, it's not the public school problems, it's the state itself. And there's nothing, we have authority over state and their decisions. Just to be speaking from my experience, I think that the ACT is a decent measure of student success on average. It's not a perfect measure. No standardized test is. It, it weeds out certain students for education or for certain institutions, no doubt. In terms of Pearson offering a curriculum, um, I wouldn't agree that they offer a curriculum per se. They might give you a general guide, um, but that's what Common Core is famous for is instituting these, which again, Mr. Stinson acknowledged, mandated by the federal government if you enroll in um, Opting out of No Child Left Behind and Race to the Top, you automatically have to do part. But the thing is, they don't really offer a curriculum with them. Uh, they essentially um, give you a general guide, and then teachers from there are somewhat given the freedom to teach it in any way they choose, but they have to meet these set standards. Um, I think the important thing to realize is with these companies like Pearson is, a uh, majority of their board, Pearson's board, are not former teachers or former professors. They are business folk, which is fine. I'm okay with that. Business personnel has a great deal of um, things to offer, much like Mr. Stinson told you, but I don't often see teachers or education professionals going to a hospital or other areas and saying that I prefer you cut a little further to the left or you know, you extract this much blood today. But then it's really easy for some reason for business professionals to come in and say, this is how you're supposed to teach when they have no degree in education. So I've always been fascinated by the idea of standardized tests created by business professionals who have never taught a day in their lives and know nothing about you. You, you know, someone, for example, I'm Mr. Andy, Mr. Stinson, who work with you. Figured we'd have a little more say in that, but apparently Mr. not. Hold can, you can, want, can we hold back? Yeah, you, you want to respond to that yeah. last point. And yeah. uh, I don't remember who asked the question, but the, the question was about those with learning disabilities and I think also with discrimination. And you know, it's amazing the, how the market fixes the very concerns that the other side has. Um, for instance, um, and then I would also touch on Mrs. Raley's point about quotas later. Uh, with these non-discrimination laws, um, one of the things about a voucher system is that uh, voucher systems are only redeemable in schools that are approved um, to, uh, as non-discriminatory schools. And I, I do give you the idea that just because they're approved doesn't mean that there's not you know, under the surface uh, type discrimination. But I would also add to the point that for schools who have kids with learning disabilities, and schools in, in urban centers who feel that they're discriminated against, often choice is the only way for them to get out of that environment. If you think about it, there's two ways currently to get out of discrimination. So if you're being discriminated against or bullied or anything like that, there's two ways to get out. Number one, your parents can go buy a house somewhere else. Okay, That's a mortgage. All right? So consider the cost of a mortgage. The other way you can do that is to use a voucher to move somewhere else. And so I ask you, if we're really trying to help kids with learning disabilities, and we're really trying to help people who've been discriminated against, is choice not a better way and a more cost-effective way for those very people to get to the schools that help them the best? And then Rachel also has a point on the discrimination, those who can turn down um, kids with learning disabilities. Um, if they do turn them down, they also lose the money from the voucher that those kids have. But also, um, with the lower skilled students who fall behind, um, personally, if I was a lower skilled student, I wouldn't want to go to a school with a bunch of smart kids. It would make me feel even stupider. If they were a lower skilled student, they could go to a school that could help them and with kids around their same skill level, so they could learn and achieve more other than being left behind with the more advanced.
enhanced students. And also, it could also hold back the more advanced students to reaching their full potential. If there's a more advanced school that kids can go to, they can learn more than they originally would if they were being held back by the slower students. I want to clarify. So the voucher system, how much is a voucher worth? Is it, is it worth whatever, if I live in Galva, what, what we spend on a student in Galva? The so voucher, let's say it's $5,000. The voucher would be commensurate to whatever the cost of education in Galva currently is. And so what they would essentially do is that they would take the local property taxes that go to the school, however much that is, plus the state money that goes to the schools, plus the federal money that goes to the schools, and they take that, they pull it together, and they would cut a voucher in that amount evenly among the people who, um, all of the eligible, I think it's from 6 years old to 17 years old, all who are eligible would, that would do that. And, and I would just add, this is a great window here, that one of the beautiful things about the voucher system uh, is that it's flexible. So if you've got a kid, if your concern is that kids won't be able to afford these great schools, um, then you can increase the voucher among those who are uh, of the lowest income. Um, that, that is certainly not uh, undoable in, in a voucher system. It's, think of it as like a backpack, okay? You can just put more in the backpack uh, of those kids who need it. Okay, so, so I live in Galva, and we spend $5,000 a year per student. And I want to go to Peoria, Notre Dame, that spends about $15,000 per student. How does one in Galva afford to go there using a voucher system? Do I have to come up with $10,000 more? dollars? not really a choice then. I'm the, the, two, the, uh, the, the two responses that are, number one, um, you would, uh, again, with the voucher system, you could increase the amount that those schools or those individuals who are low income can receive. Um, secondly, I think to assume that, what was the school you used? Peoria Notre Dame. Peoria Notre Dame. Right. To assume that Peoria Notre, Peoria Notre Dame is the only school that could meet that child's name or is the only good school is to completely undermine markets altogether. Uh, the incentive of markets is to provide many good schools. As long as there's somebody who's interested in purchasing good education, markets will provide good education. And for a price that individuals can afford. <laughs> okay, Kat, you had a Twitter. Yeah, I have two Twitter questions okay. right now. And the first one is distance and Rachel. And it's how are you going to measure what school is bad and what schools need to get rid of? Once again, it's like, like if someone, like if they have enough students, they can stay on it, even if, like, people aren't going to go to this, like a bad school. So, if, as long as they have students and they're excelling, that they should be able to keep their students. I would ask that. How do you guys decide when you shop on Amazon what is a good product and what is a bad product? Okay. Um, what Choice ends up doing is that it takes away, I don't expect government to choose what's best for you. Okay? I expect you, cooperatively, to decide which schools are best. I think it's much, much more effective to let consumers decide what's best than to let a government system decide what's best. Or, God forbid, standardized testing, as flawed as that is, to decide what's best. So, I think you guys is the answer to that. I think you choose what schools are good and bad. One other question. All right, and then the next one is to Norman Curran, and it's, if you agree that the education system is failing, then how do you fix it without school choice? I'll, I'll start, and then you can go. Uh, I mean, the real issue here, like you said, that competition is what Mr. Stinson is focusing on. And again, competition works in certain environments. Um, it's becoming problematic when you're splitting taxpayer funds between two schools, especially in a smaller community, like Galva is the example he gave, so I'll go off of it. Um, we wouldn't have the issues had the state not, for example, cut from the budget numbers she'll show you so much money from transportation so much money from general education, general state aid. These are man-made problems based on the markets that failed in 08. When you look at the, or the, excuse me, the economy tanking in 08 for a variety of reasons, mostly a housing bubble and a variety of other measures, that's when the voucher system became popular, when the markets failed. And as a result, money was taken out of the easiest target, education, because few will defend it. As a result, you're seeing a lot of public schools fail. Had the amount of money that was originally going into, for example, Galva School stayed there and had not been pulled back in the state of Illinois, um, we wouldn't be seeing the, sort of the problems we are. I mean, go back to two years ago, look at the number of staff members we have in the yearbook and count them now. The math is simple. Uh, we don't have a lot of people that we used to have. As a result, yes, we have struggled more. My idea is that if we just concentrated funds that were originally there 
and pay what we're supposed to pay, public schools can indeed have the resources necessary to provide for all students, whether that be students who excel, students with learning disabilities. Um, this is an environment, again, one of the few environments where we have all types of students learning in one place. I don't think that we should be segregating schools based upon ability. I'm going, to, I'm going to remind the audience too, please hang on to your questions. If, remember, on day two we'll continue the questioning because we've probably got about two minutes left. About two minutes left. So Richard, well, go ahead real quick. I have a question about the funding again. Because yes. you said you can, the backpack, you can add more money to it. Who adds the money? The parents? The government? And if the government does, where does it come from? The school district that pulls it out of their co coffers? Is, you know, because my understanding is... Uh, Schools are funded by property taxes, by how much your house is worth. Okay, family A has six children. They pay a specific amount of property taxes. Will they get six vouchers that will be worth only what their property taxes are? Or will they get six worth six property taxes? So if, if so say your property taxes you pay four thousand dollars to the school district. And you got six kids you want to send them to the private school. Six times four is twenty-four thousand. But you only pay four, they're going to get twenty-four thousand dollars worth of uh, vouchers. And, and what about the people who don't pay? I don't have any children, but I still pay the property taxes, and I'm happy to do that for the school. So it's just the funding part of it is, is what really concerns me. Uh, I think the answer to the question is that the amount of funding uh, really doesn't change. Uh, it's, it's just how that funding is administered. So right now, there are people who, like yourself, who, who don't have kids, who pay taxes to a public school system that costs, let's say, eight or nine thousand dollars a year to attend. So that would be your taxes would not change whatsoever. I, I understand, but they're going to take my tax dollars and give to somebody else, so they can take the money out of my community and send them ah, somewhere else. But here's the, here's the extra point. I think we have to get straight what our goal is. So as a community, our goal is to provide education not schooling. Schooling is very, very different than education, okay? And so if your responsibility is, and I think we would all agree, to provide education, then it's not your responsibility to provide funding for a local school, but rather to provide funding or means for kids to get educated.